Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, some housekeeping. So my episode before last on death with Frank Ostaseski was an episode that many of you found incredibly valuable. I can't really recall an outpouring of such gratitude in response to an episode. And so I just wanted to say that if any of you had ignored that because the topic put you off, uh, you might rethink that. Also, there was an intro which was unusual for the podcast, but which is very similar to the kinds of content I'm putting on my app. In fact, that intro in some form may just go on the app. So if you're interested to see the kind of approach I'll take in the, the lesson track on the app, that intro will give you some indication. And yes, the app is still struggling to be born. I am far past the point of making promises as to when you'll have it. It's still in beta on iOS. But slowly, slowly, it will see the light of day. And this will be a subscription-based app like Headspace and Calm. So charging $10 or $12 a month seems to be the going rate for apps like this. However, it will be perpetually free for supporters of the podcast. You will definitely get it first, and you will get it free. So stay tuned for that. Also, we're gearing up to launch my new website, and much of the motivation here is to have an improved experience for supporters of the podcast. The AMA page will operate better. Also, there will be a searchable archive of answered AMA questions, so that when you click on the question, you'll be taken to the actual start of the relevant audio. Also, I'm in the process of hiring a few more full-time employees, so um, the operation is growing over here, and it's growing entirely because those of you who support the show support it. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you can always do that at samharris.org forward slash support. What else here? I'm gearing up for my first live podcasts in December, Seattle and San Francisco. And uh, there'll be some more dates hitting the calendar in February and March. I will announce those soon. Probably have five more dates to add there. The book club event with Steve Pinker in Los Angeles on March 14th. Those tickets will probably go on sale to supporters, hopefully early in December. And I think supporters will have first crack at those for, for at least three weeks. So I'll have more to say about that when tickets become available, but I can announce the venue now. It will be at the Dolby Theater in Hollywood, which is, if you don't know it, a great venue. I just saw Ricky Gervais there. It's about 3,400 seats. So it seems like a great place to launch the book club, and I will have more details probably in my next podcast. Okay. Today I'm speaking with Jennifer Doudna. Jennifer is a biochemist. She's a professor in the chemistry and the molecular and cell biology departments at the University of California at Berkeley. She's also an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a researcher in the molecular biophysics and integrated bioimaging division at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She is one of the world's experts on RNA protein biochemistry and, in particular, CRISPR biology. And she's the author, along with Samuel Sternberg, of the book A Crack in Creation, Gene Editing and the Unthinkable Power to Control Evolution. And Jennifer is credited as one of the inventors of the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology, which is the topic of today's conversation. Uh, We get into all the details and the ethics. And uh, time was short. Jennifer is a, a rock star scientist and... I could only schedule about an hour with her, but uh, I will take it. It was great to have her walk me through the details of CRISPR. And I trust you will leave this podcast as I did, knowing much more about where this technology is at present and where it's all likely to head. So without further delay, I bring you Jennifer Doudna. I am here with Jennifer Doudna. Jennifer, thanks for coming on the podcast. Great to be here, Sam. 
So you are a co-inventor of CRISPR-Cas9, which is a gene editing technology that we'll talk about. Before we get into this, perhaps you can just give a kind of potted summary of your background scientifically. Well, I, I, uh, I'm a biochemist, so I'm somebody who studies molecules and how they work. And I've always been interested in evolution and uh, the way that, that cells have evolved to use their genetic information in precise ways. And that's actually how we got into the, the whole area of gene editing. And you're at UC Berkeley, right? I'm at UC Berkeley, correct. Now, I know there's some controversy about who should get credit for inventing CRISPR-Cas9, and we don't really have to go into that. I think there clearly is no controversy that you are one of the world's experts on this. Is there anything you want to say about the controversy, or is it kind of a distraction as far as this conversation is concerned? Well, I guess all I would say is that uh, my work with Emmanuel Charpentier was, uh, you know, going on to really, I would call it a curiosity-driven uh, project that was aimed at discovering how bacteria fight viral infections. So neither of us were aiming to create a, a technology, but, um, but the work that we did uncovered the activity of a protein that can be programmed to find and cut DNA sequences. And with that, with that understanding, it was uh, pretty obvious that this was going to be a great a great technology. And that was work that was published in, in 2012. So I don't think anybody argues about that. Right. Okay, well, let's talk about CRISPR and, and that protein. But before we do, it might be good to give a very quick remedial summary of some basic molecular biology. I think we have a fairly educated audience here, but everyone, I think, can do with a primer on DNA to RNA to protein. And, you know, because we're going to be talking about just the mechanics of gene editing here. So can you give us a, a few minutes of basic biology here? Sure, absolutely. So I guess we could start by, by pointing out that um, people probably are familiar with the idea that DNA encodes genetic information. So it's, it's really the chemical that stores information in cells and allows uh, cells to grow and develop and become tissues or, or whole organisms. And the way that cells uh, use that information is mostly in the form of proteins. So the information in the DNA is converted into, into uh, proteins by a process that creates the protein molecules by reading the code in the DNA. And the intermediary in that process is, is, uh, is kind of what I like to call a throwaway a copy of the genetic information, which is uh, our, our molecules of RNA. And what has emerged over the last probably two decades is that RNA molecules are not just throwaway copies of, of the genome, but they are actually uh, molecules that have a lot of interesting functions in their own right. And that's actually what I've always been interested in in my own laboratory, is the role of RNA molecules that are um, involved in, in controlling the flow of genetic information and helping cells decide when and how to use the, the information that's stored in the genome, in the DNA. And uh, the, the story of CRISPR, the story of this gene editing technology, is, is kind of interesting because it really involves all three of those types of fundamental molecules, DNA, RNA, and protein, because it's a protein that is involved in the, is, is really responsible for cutting DNA in a, uh, at precise positions the places in the DNA that get cut are defined by molecules of RNA that, hold, that the protein, uh, which is called Cas9, holds onto. And the places in the DNA that get cut are the sites in the genome where editing occurs, where permanent changes are made to the genetic code. And so you discovered this in bacteria, right? CRISPR has been described as part of the bacterial immune system. That's correct. Take me there. So what happens? Viruses periodically infect bacteria. And what does the CRISPR sequence do in that context? Right. So viruses infect bacteria actually all the time in nature. And so bacteria have a, a very effective way of defending against viruses by storing pieces of viral DNA in their own chromosome. And then they use that, they use that uh, stored viral DNA sequence. There actually are multiple 
uh, multiple sequences coming, you know, one representing each uh, virus that has infected the cell over time. So, it's, so you can think of it sort of like a, a genetic vaccination card. And then those, those stored viral uh, DNA sequences are copied into RNA. And then those RNA molecules assemble with the Cas9 protein to direct it to sequences that match the, the, the RNA sequence. In other words, sequences that are, uh, belong to viruses. And when that match occurs, then the, the Cas9 protein works like a, like a molecular scalpel and cuts the, the, the viral DNA and, and, and basically allows the cell to, to, to destroy it. So again, this is semi-dense material and you don't have the benefit of visual aids here. So I just want to make another pass on this just to make sure everyone has a picture of what's happening here. So you have this little machine, really. It's a combination of protein molecule and RNA, which is really informing its behavior, right? So you have an RNA sequence that matches a sequence in the DNA, which determines what part of the DNA it will bind to and edit or cut. And this is something you've discovered in bacteria, but which can be used as a kind of molecular scalpel in eukaryotes like mammals such as ourselves. And this then becomes a way of targeting with a precision that we didn't have before spots in the human genome that can be edited. You nailed it. That's perfect. Okay. So I guess I'm interested a little more in the mechanics of this. So what are the chances that the CRISPR-Cas9 technology will cut in the wrong place in the genome? I mean, does there have to be a complete complementarity between the RNA and the DNA, or is there some potential for error here? Sure, there's always potential for error. Uh, um, I think the amazing thing about the CRISPR-Cas9 technology is that it's, it's really pretty accurate, and uh, uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's close to. So I think I think what's emerged over the last few years that people have been uh, using this, and you know, it's probably worth mentioning that this technology took off incredibly uh, quickly. Uh, you know, it was adopted very, very rapidly after after our 2012 publication, and um, you know, there are now uh, probably uh, you know thousands of people around the world using this as a tool in all sorts of systems. And the good thing about that, or one of them, is that is that it's meant that there's been re- very rapid uh, development of of the technology as well as understanding of how it works and one of the things that's emerged is that uh, this this tool is um, you know it's accurate enough to make uh, precise changes in even very large uh, genomes like the human genome or plant uh, plant genomes and when when people have have uh, sort of as I think as uh, people have become more sophisticated about using it ensuring that uh, the the Cas9 protein is uh, used in limiting amounts in cells, not not uh, not present in in huge quantities and not hanging around for too long. That it's it's actually remarkably uh, accurate at at uh, generating those kinds of edits. It's possible to find uh, off targets, but it's you have to look pretty hard. And can you edit a single base pair, or does it do you have to deal with longer sequences than that? You can edit a single base pair. Yeah. Wow. So you've described this as a scalpel. Now, what happens after the DNA is cut? Is it always a matter of inserting more DNA, a variant sequence, or can you simply cut and remove parts of the DNA? Yes, you can cut and remove, or, or you can cut and replace. The, the removal part is, is, turns out to be easier technically to do than the replacing part, but, uh, but both are possible. So, again, this is so counterintuitive in ways when you actually picture what's happening here, because, you know, anyone who's taken biology in recent memory will know that the genetic material inside our cells is in the nucleus, and it's bound very tight. It's just crammed in there. Is that the chromosomes aren't laid out in the pretty way that they are when we picture them in textbooks. And now you've sent CRISPR, this little machine into the cell. We'll talk about how you can target tissues later on, but this goes into the cell and moves all over the genome and is searching for the sequence to which it is the mate and so that it can find the place to cut. How does it search 
the whole genome? How do you get full coverage of a genome? And how quickly does this happen? If we could take a video camera inside a cell, what would we be seeing there? Well, we've sort of done that, uh, not quite a video camera, but it's been possible to make fluorescently labeled versions of the Cas9 protein that can be visualized in live cells. So you can watch, you can basically watch these little dots of light moving around in the nucleus. And when you do that kind of experiment, what, what uh, emerges is that this is a protein that is, has very fast kinetics. So it's moving around the nucleus incredibly quickly, much more quickly than what you see for other kinds of proteins that are you know, existing in the, in the nucleus. And what's, what's uh, thought to happen is that this protein is rapidly sampling different sections along the, the sequence of DNA. And it's, it is quite remarkable to think about it because, you know, we're talking about um, billions of, of base pairs of DNA uh, in the cell. But, but somehow this, this protein uh, very quickly samples uh, along the, the DNA sequence looking for a match to the guide RNA sequence. And, and one thing that's important to keep in mind is that it's not a single uh, protein that would be in the nucleus, but instead many, many copies of this. There might be you know, thousands or tens of thousands of copies that are all searching. And uh, when one finds its uh, target site, then it makes a cut and the edit occurs. Mm. Now, are the sequences of DNA unique enough so that we're not getting redundant cuts else? I mean, if you send a, you know, a 10 nucleotide sequence as your kind of search code, are we expecting that to be the only place in the genome that would get modified? Or just by dint of numbers, you're going to be altering something you didn't expect to alter if you do that? Well, in one of those interesting serendipities of science, this Cas9 protein actually uses a 20 nucleotide RNA sequence. So it's 20 letters that it's looking for, 20 letters in a row. And if you do the math, that's just about uh, what you need to uniquely define a sequence in the, in the, the human genome, for example. Good. The N- numbers were on our side. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's back up. So now we have a human being who has a variety of genes that are not as perfect as they might be. And we'll talk about the conditions for which we have some understanding of the underlying genetics and, you know, what could be modified here. But let's say we know what genes we want to alter. How would we target CRISPR to specific sites in the body? And presumably, these insertions would sometimes need to be tissue specific. You wouldn't want to send this everywhere, right? Right. And I think you're putting your finger on what I think is one of the the critical challenges for gene editing in the clinic going forward, which is uh, just what you said. How do we deliver these uh, editing molecules into the right cells at the right time? One of the ways that this can be done today is actually by delivering into cells that are temporarily taken out of the body. So, uh, for example, people are working hard on correcting mutations that cause blood disorders because the blood cells can actually be taken out, edited, and, and replaced. So that's, I, I think that's, a, that's one strategy that gets around the issue of trying to deliver something like this into specific uh, tissues in a, in a person. That's a, that's a much bigger challenge. And why is it a challenge? I mean, what, what would be the mechanism? Would you use some viral vector to deliver it? If you wanted to get it into every cell in the body, what would be the methodology? Well, that would be hard, uh, even, even using a virus, uh, because viruses tend to target particular kinds of cells. So you might have to use a cocktail of viruses that are able to get into you know, many different types of, of cells. But I think what, what is uh, typically envisioned is that you might be able to use viruses that would deliver into uh, specific parts of the body, for example, into the into the liver or or into the brain, and create edits that would alleviate disease in cases where the the gene edit is necessary just in in those kinds of cells. And what is the time frame over which this would occur? I mean, just so again, we'll talk about how difficult this might be in practice, but 
let's say we know the gene we want to edit and we have the way to target the relevant tissue and someone has a disease born of this malfunctioning gene, how quickly would CRISPR change their genome and cancel the disease? Well, in principle, very quickly. Um, I, I, I've seen some data in animal models of disease, for example, in mice, where mice get an injection and within a matter of, you know, a couple of days, you can start to detect edits in the DNA of the cells that have been uh, targeted in the treatment. So I think the idea in principle, and I think this is something the field is working towards doing, is that gene editing would be a fairly fast uh, kind of treatment. And furthermore, and this is actually very important to appreciate, is that it's a, it's a different kind of therapy because it's really a one-and-done treatment it's in principle, right? The idea is you would do this once and then you don't have to do it again. Yeah. I really want to get into the ethics of all of this because that is quite interesting and obviously this worries a lot of people. But before we do, so what are the most plausible first uses of this as far as therapy? I mean, what are the conditions for which the genetics are well understood and we are just gearing up to get in there and start changing genes? Well, I think one area is is uh, blood disorders, sickle cell anemia, uh, thalassemias, those kinds of things. I think that's one area where there's uh, a lot of action and uh, activity in terms of developing this this technology for clinical use. The other is um, is uh, eye diseases, and the eye is uh, sort of an interesting tissue from the perspective of of treatment because it's a relatively isolated area that would need to be treated. And so the thinking there is that you could use either a viral system or even just some kind of direct injection in a very localized area to get the kind of editing that would be therapeutically beneficial. Yeah, I think you've hit on one of the easiest vanity uses of this technology as well. You could just change eye color, couldn't you? <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe. <laughs> Anyone who's unhappy with their eye color, they can just <laughs> consult your dermatologist or your ophthalmologist or whoever's going to get this first. <laughs> we should also say that some of the implications of this have nothing to do with fixing what ails us, at least directly. We can also talk about manipulating the environment and even canceling the existence of whole species. And the mosquito is first on the list here. And the technology that would do this is something called a gene drive. Can you say something about that? Sure. So gene drive is, a, is a, a phrase that refers to using gene editing to introduce a genetic trait very quickly into a population, basically spread it through all the, the organisms in a, in a population. And, um, and it became kind of feasible once the, the CRISPR technology was developed because the, the CRISPR system is so efficient at creating gene edits that uh, this can be carried out in a, you know, if you have a population of rapidly, uh, rapidly reproducing organisms like, like insects, you can, you can uh, set it up so that these insects acquire a trait and then it gets spread through their, all of their uh, members of their, their group in, a, in an incredibly rapid fashion. This, this has already been demonstrated in the laboratory and the idea for how it might be useful is to, for example, create mosquitoes that are uh, unable to spread mosquito-borne diseases like Zika virus or dengue or something like that. Could you create mosquitoes that would just be unable to breed as well? Yes. That's also the idea, is uh, an, an idea for using gene drive. I must say I'm partial to that idea. What do you think about <laughs> just w wiping out the species? Can we play God just here in this limited case? <laughs> Well, it sounds appealing to get rid of uh, mosquitoes, but on the other hand, they are a, a very important food source for certain animals like bats. So the, you know, the environmental impact is uh, unclear. Hmm. You're, you're putting a lot of pressure on my fondness for bats here. <laughs> Don't bats eat something else? I'm sure mosquitoes aren't the only thing they can eat. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, you know, but I, I, that's an example that, that people point to, I guess, to sort of illustrate that, you know, there could be unintended consequences uh, that would have uh, environmental impacts beyond uh, what we might initially intend for something like this. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it's hard to see a downside in making mosquitoes impervious to spreading malaria. That would be a pretty easy call, I think. I would agree. Okay, so the good uses of this technology are just absolutely obvious, and this is just like the best scientific news anyone's ever heard until you start thinking of the possible downsides or the bad uses and the unintended consequences. So what most worries you about how this could go wrong for us? I think that the truth is that the thing I worry about the most is is primarily just um, people getting out ahead of the technology itself. I think that whenever uh, a transformative tool comes along, it, it's easy to get get you know very very excited about the potential of using it and um, and and for for something like this that is widely available and relatively simple for labs that are experienced in in molecular biology to to use it. It means that you know there's just a lot of people out there that are you know trying things, and and I, I think the thing I worry about the most is just uh, uh, some kind of um, unintended consequence, or or even uh, even something that is done intentionally that leads to a, a backlash of some kind. I think I just saw didn't someone, some scientist or lecturer on Facebook just apply CRISPR to himself? Uh, yes. As a, I didn't really follow the details there. Was this a a totally irresponsible and perhaps suicidal use of the technology, or was it innocuous? I think it was probably innocuous because I don't I don't know if it really worked. But um, but I think just the idea that someone could inject this into themselves um, with the purpose of you know doing some kind of editing in their body is a it's kind of a wild idea. One distinction we haven't made, which we should remind people of, is there's a difference between editing an individual's genome in a way that's called a somatic edit and a germline edit. Want to take 10 seconds to distinguish those? Absolutely. That's an important difference. So um, when we talk about somatic cell editing, that basically means making changes to cells that are that are not going to lead to um, heritable changes. In other words, not changing the, the, the germline of an organism. Whereas the uh, changes to the germline mean changes that are happening in eggs or sperm or embryos, some, some uh, cells that are capable of creating an entire organism. And, uh, and when that kind of edit is, is made, it means that those edits are, can, you know, can be passed on to future generations. That's really the amazing fact here, which is leaving aside the possibility of curing more or less every disease that has a genetic basis, and we'll talk about the implications there, but we're also talking about an ability to determine how we evolve as a species. And so, you know, all descendants would inherit the consequences of what we do here, though they would also be given the technology, presumably, to make further changes if they didn't like what they had inherited. Do you think that we are heading into a Gattaca-like societal change. And I'm, I can't be the first person who's brought up this movie to you. <laughs> How do you picture society responding once this technology becomes widely available? Well, I, I guess I feel that um, in the long run, we're probably going in that direction, but it's not going to happen that quickly. I think that the, you know, the technology is still in its infancy, really. And, um, and as you pointed out, you know, it's, it, it, it hasn't been widely adopted yet for, um, certainly not, it's certainly not uh, being widely used in clinical medicine yet, even though there's a lot of uh, work going on in that direction. And one of the things that, that, uh, that holds back the use of, of this kind of technology for any any Gattaca type uh, application is is frankly our own lack of understanding of the of our own genetics. You know, just the what what genes are responsible for different kinds of traits, and that's you know that's information that that you know it'll come, but it, it it'll take time. Is there regulation in place here, or are governments trying to catch up to the science? I think both. You know, there's a. I think we're fortunate here in the U.S. that there is quite a good 
regulatory framework for dealing with uh, something like this that largely came about uh, going all the way back to the 1970s when scientists were grappling with the ethics of using molecular cloning at the time. And that, and it, uh, that was, uh, you know, when the sort of the early days of, of modern molecular biology, when it first became possible to copy segments of DNA and and make clones of individual genes, you know, sort of copy those genes and um, have bacteria engineered to generate many, many copies of genes and produce proteins and things like that. So a lot of the, the groundwork for regulatory um, uh, guidelines were put in place at that time, and they turn out to be quite robust. And I think even for, you know, so you, sort of today, you know, 30 or 40 years later, uh, we still have uh, the, the, the basis from those days to, you know, deal with uh, new technologies as they come along, including gene editing. That being said, I think that, you know, it's, the field is moving so quickly that it, you know, it becomes critical for regulatory agencies to be continually evaluating where the technology is, where it's going, and whether there do need to be revisions to guidelines or even new ones put in place to ensure safety. Mm. And uh, assuming we put our house in order, uh, we being the United States, how confident are you that countries like China or Singapore or any other country that would also have this technology would follow a similar program? Well, I. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's very hard to I imagine how regulations in one country would be enforced globally. I think it's probably impossible to do that. So I think the next best thing is to have uh, guidelines and, and recommendations that are, are uh, prepared by coalitions of, of people from different countries who come together and, you know, basically agree on a set of, uh, of procedures or, or um, sort of norm, norms of use that get adopted uh, globally. Even the best case scenario opens the door to some serious concerns. So let's just say that the technology works perfectly and we perfectly understand what we want to edit and why, right? So take an obvious thing on the menu, you know, human intelligence, right? Or even just a narrow band of intelligence. Let's call it G for short, if we understand the genetics of that and we can change our genes so as to improve our intelligence or the intelligence of our kids, that is something that people will really want to do provided that it's safe, right? And again, let's just stipulate that it will be safe or can be made safe. If you turn up the dial on safety, right, so that it is really, you know, perfectly safe, then it begins to seem completely irresponsible, at least as a parent, not to give your child the advantage of the highest intelligence you could deliver, stipulating that there's no downside you know, to being too intelligent or that you haven't changed genes that increase the likelihood of certain diseases, which in the case of intelligence actually seems like it could well be the case. that There are certain alleles that seem to correlate with increased intelligence, but they also correlate with diseases that nobody wants, so that you'd be left as a parent deciding whether, you know, you want to, to up the odds that your kid's going to be in a wheelchair for all this brain power. But let's say we get lucky, and that's not the case. There really are straightforward manipulations that can increase human intelligence or human beauty or athletic ability. And whatever regulations we have here in the U.S., if those regulations don't exist in Singapore, well, then you're going to see you know, wealthy people booking trips of genetic tourism to get their genes modified. How do you think about that? Is there a reason to be worried about this? I mean, one consequence I see immediately is that if this is expensive to do, and again, this is the best case scenario, there are no downsides, all of this works, people come out smarter and happier when you do this to them. If it's expensive, you know, only rich people will do it first. And unlike many other things that rich people get to do first, this is the thing that allows you to further consolidate all of the advantages of wealth. This is like an engine of wealth inequality of a sort that we have never seen before. Yeah, 
I, I think you're describing a scenario that is um, is frankly not not coming anytime soon. But I but I do think that you're right to point out that the you know some of the issues that you're raising about access and and um, you know who who decides and who pays for such such changes if they were to come become uh, available and 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 were known to be safe to use and beneficial to people uh, yeah i think it does you know it raises some really profound questions i think that it also to me it it also raises questions of sort of who we are as human beings i mean i think one of the things that makes humanity so wonderful in a way is that there is incredible variety in you know in in life and and among different people and um you know i think for something like intelligence to me it's actually hard to even define that really because you know i know people that are brilliant artists and they're not brilliant mathematicians but you know they're but they're still brilliant in their way right and and i think that that um it's just very hard to to put your finger on what you would do if you had if you had the knowledge of genes to change to create um, certain intellectual capabilities, would we really want to have a society where everybody has, uh, where certain people have similar uh, intellectual traits? I, I, I think it takes something away from who we are as humans, frankly. Do you really think that? Well, first, before I push back on that, as far as the time frame is concerned, that when you say this isn't going to happen soon, the limiting factor there really it sounds like it's not so much the technology anymore. I mean, that sounds like that will be available in a time frame we really have to think about. It's the understanding of the genetics for any trait we care about, right? Agreed. So if we suddenly discover something about us, some gene that does some fairly heavy lifting in a trait we care about, you know, whether it's intelligence or empathy or, you know, just, you know, facial recognition or just any discrete faculty that lo and behold, we found the gene or the 10 genes that really deliver a significant change when you change them, all of a sudden we'll be ambushed by the question of whether or not to use this. You're not saying that it's going to take us 30 years to be able to edit what we want to edit. It's just it may take us 30 years or 50 years or 100 years to know what we want to edit. Yes, agreed. So yeah, I, I think this could we could well be surprised very quickly by what we're tempted to do. And yeah, however long it takes, at some point the day will arrive. And again, you know, leaving aside the trade-offs that we may not find a way around. I mean, it just could be that increasing the benefits in one direction comes with a downside or a potential downside. But as far as the benefits of or the value we place on diversity here, my hunch is those are oversold. Take your favorite artist who's not all that good at biochemistry. He or she may, in fact, want to be just like you in the lab, provided there's no zero-sum competition between his or her artistic ability and an ability to think like you do, right? So, But there's the rub, right? There, There's the rub. But there's no... But, but I... I don't think there's a good reason to think that there really are big trade-offs here. You know, it's like you can get a Leonardo da Vinci who has a kind of omnibus capacity for intellectual and creative life. Now, again, that could be some trade-offs. I'm not discounting that possibility, but it is possible to be really smart, really creative, a great athlete, physically extremely attractive. I mean, like you can sort of win the lottery genetically. And then it's just a matter of what you feel like doing with it. I don't think we will, again, you just have to picture what it will be like to know that the technology is safe and effective. I don't think people will be very sentimental about diversity as we know it. Well, they might. I mean, I, I think I think what you're describing again to me is is still in the realm of of science fiction because we just don't. I, I think it's going to be a long time before the genes responsible for all of those sorts of traits are known. And furthermore, 
my guess is that you know the, we're talking about probably hundreds, if not thousands, of genes, and it probably is not as simple as making a change to a few letters in those genes. But it, you know, it's more about genes in a particular genetic uh, background. So I think what you're what you're talking about is 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 quite far in the future. I think what's 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 potentially going to happen first is that it will be possible to do things like, like I'll give you a specific example that I think is sort of interesting to think about. Imagine that you could make edits to a single gene that is known to, is well documented to be involved in high cholesterol. So it, you know, people that have this uh, particular form of this gene um, are susceptible to heart disease, but if a change is made, kind of a simple change to the gene, they are effectively protected from any kind of cardiovascular disease for their entire life. They're not going to have to take statins or anything like that. And, you know, what if, what if something like that were offered to parents? I want it. It sounds, sounds good, right? I'm expecting an email from you when you get that in the lab. <laughs> and so, so I, but I think it's an interesting case because it, it you know, is that, is that, is that enhancement or is that, you know, is that you're, are you doing it for health? And I think you'd want to know that, um, there's no risk to doing it and you'd want to know that there's no downside to making that change. Um, but if you knew that were the case, I think everybody would say, yes, I want that. And you might even say it's sort of unethical not to do it. Yeah. And I think the boundary between enhancement and therapy that you just drew is something that won't withstand much scrutiny. I mean, we spend our entire lives trying to enhance ourselves. I mean, just to think of the energy that goes into trying to raise children to be happy and healthy and wise and intelligent and creative. And it would be irresponsible not to give your child every advantage you can, compatible with a society that's built around some semblance of fairness. And when you think about just how much of what we care about is anchored to the genome, you know, if not totally defined by it, I mean, just to speak about the human mind, it seems that more or less everything we care about is at least, you know, 50% beholden to our genes. And we furiously work on our environments, you know, both personally and collectively to try to do the best we can with the biology we have. But the moment you start talking about being able to change the genes, I don't know, it just seems like, you know, this is a point I'm sure that's been made to you, but people risk their lives for unnecessary surgeries, you know, to change the way they look. And we have accepted that as just kind of a normal human activity. And yet it's a fairly extraordinary thing to do when you think about it. I just think safety and efficacy will be the measure of whether or not this should be done. But the moment you give me safe and effective, it seems like all the friction comes out of the system and people will just demand to be able to do this. Yeah, I think that's probably true. As far as the time frame, what do you think for the conditions we most understand? I mean, when would you expect people to be given some choices here? You know, going to their doctor and their doctor says, well, we could use CRISPR on this problem. Boy, yeah, it's always hard to guess with time frames like that because, you know, with the, any kind of therapeutic, you have to have safety, you have to have effectiveness. And, it, you know, these things would have to go through clinical trials. So I think, you know, we're probably talking, you know, several years at least. Well, this is so fascinating. And this is unlike many conversations. I'm confident this is not going away anytime soon. This is just a glimpse of what the rest of our lives will look like. I know um, you both caught a flu that CRISPR couldn't, <laughs> couldn't protect you from. <laughs> and uh, our time is short, and you've been very generous. Is there anything else that we should talk about here that you want to give people some perspective on? Yeah, there is something else, and that is I think it's important for people to appreciate how science actually works, you know, and how, how new technologies come about. It gets, we're kind of circling back to what you, the way that you started the, the conversation today. But I think that I'd like to just point out that 
I have now been doing science for, you know, professionally for almost 25 years. And what I've seen over that period of time is that there's an incredibly, uh, you know, there's a there's just sort of an incredible combination of serendipity and um, occasional flashes of insight that, you know, that go into any kind of scientific endeavor. And I think that that if we look at the way that new technologies arise, and CRISPR is is one example, but you know there are, are obviously many others. They often come about through uh, curiosity-driven research, and there's you know that type of work has come under fire in our country in in recent years, especially. And uh, you know there's a been a push towards. Uh, wanting scientists to be very focused on curing cancer or solving heart disease and those sorts of things, and uh, I think it's you know it's important to appreciate that that uh, I think that we need to have we need to have a balance between focused projects like that that are aimed at uh, particular outcomes, but we also need to have work that's going on that just encourages curious, creative people to ask fundamental questions about how the world works, because it's often through that kind of endeavor that new technologies arise. And, and uh, you know, we can't we can't predict where they're going to where, where new things are going to come from. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that. That is a super important point that we lose sight of. And I think we lose sight of it more and more as these efforts become increasingly privatized and kind of market driven. I mean, obviously, if the market is going to dictate the science you do, it really does have to have some tangible payoff. You have to think you understand what the payoff is in advance. And so you, you basically become a technologist more than a, a scientist. But as you said, you know, given that we are still struggling to understand how the world works, you know, we are investigating reality as we can come into contact with it. And given how much we don't know, there's just no way of knowing what useful insights we'll find just by following our curiosity. And so if you close the door to mere curiosity and just try to hew to the engineering problems and the technology problems as you understand them, you're just, I mean, it seems like a guaranteed way not to make the kind of startling progress that scientists make even on those goal-driven engineering focused technical questions. Yep, exactly. Yeah, well, listen, this, this is just amazing work that you have done and I feel guilty stealing even an hour of your time. Get back <laughs> in the lab and uh, <laughs> and cure us. <laughs> if you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, and you'll get exclusive access to my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as to the AMA page on my website, where you can pose questions and vote on the